Numerical Analysis of Transmission Lines. In this video, we're going to discuss an easy way that we can numerically analyze transmission lines to calculate the distributed inductance, distributed capacitance, and then from that, the impedance of the line. And of course, we can visualize the electric potential and also the electric fields. Governing equations. So of course, we always have to start off with Maxwell's equations. We have four of them. We have our two divergence equations, and we also have our two curl equations. Now, transmission lines are usually much, 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 much smaller than the wavelength. And so the voltage along the line, the current along the line, at least at the scale of the transmission line, does not change that quickly. And in fact, we can make an electrostatic approximation and analyze that electrostatically. So that means we will set all of our time derivatives equal to zero. And when we do that, Maxwell's equation simplified to something like this. And then I've color coded the equations. I've put two of them in red and I've put two of them in blue. And so what we see now is Maxwell's equations have actually decoupled into two independent sets of equations. The blue equations are what we'll use to describe electrostatics. And the red equations is what we'll use to describe magnetostatics. Now for analysis of transmission line, we're not getting into the magnetostatic equations. We will proceed with the electrostatic equations. So we need our governing equations. And then from those, we will derive the differential equations that we solve. So we have our Maxwell's equations for electrostatics. So we have our del dot D equals zero. This is our divergence equation. And this basically just says that the electric field cannot diverge from a point. And that's because we're assuming no charges right here. We also have that the curl of the electric field is zero. So del cross E has to equal zero. Well, those two equations, D and E, are not coupled, but we know that they're coupled through the constitutive relation. So we also need that. And we need one other thing because it's possible in electrostatics to not have to solve a vector equation. And in fact, the electric field is related to the electric potential through the negative gradient. And I'll even add that the electric field and the electric potential are not two different phenomena. We're describing the same physical phenomenon just two different ways mathematically. Well, the electric potential, sometimes I call this the scalar potential, but it's the electric potential that's a scalar quantity. So if we can derive our differential equation that we need to solve in terms of that electric potential, we have a much easier problem on our hands. So that's what we're going to do. At the top of this slide, we have our governing equations. From these, we would like to derive that single differential equation that we can solve to analyze our transmission lines. So if we look at this first equation, delta D equals zero, we would like to get rid of D. And we can do that by looking at equation three and seeing that D equals epsilon E. We can take this epsilon E, plug that in for D, and now we've eliminated D. So we sort of have this new divergence equation with this dielectric constant sitting here. Maybe we would like to write del dot E equals zero. We can't do that. And that's because our dielectric function here is a function of position. So it changes with X, Y, and Z. So when we try to take a derivative of it, that's not zero. So we are not able to bring this to the outside. It has to stay right there. But also remember, we would like a scalar differential equation. And so our next step then is to replace the electric field E now with the negative gradient of this electric potential. And when we do that, we end up here. And that is our final differential equation that we have to solve to analyze our transmission line in the electrostatic approximation. This is also called the inhomogeneous Laplace's equation. The last thing, and you'll see why later on, we're going to want to solve this with the permittivity set to a constant. So we're not gonna let it vary. In fact, we'll probably just set it to air. But the point is it's a constant, so it can come to the outside of this divergence operation. Then we can divide both sides and it disappears. 
And so what we called inhomogeneous Laplace's equation will reduce to the homogeneous Laplace's equation. So the epsilon disappears, and this actually becomes what is called the Laplacian operation, the scalar Laplacian. And this is our new differential equation we would solve if the permittivity were a constant everywhere. So we'll need to expand this into Cartesian coordinates. And so the scalar Laplacian expanded into Cartesian coordinates looks something like this. Now, the next thing, we're analyzing our transmission line in the cross section, and we will call that the XY plane. So our signal will be traveling in the Z direction. But since our line is uniform in the Z direction and nothing is changing in the Z direction, we're free to just set this Z derivative to zero. And when we do that, we end up with really the final form of the homogeneous Laplace's equation that we'll be working with. Numerical representations. The first thing we are after, and really the big step in analyzing a transmission line, is calculating this electric potential surrounding the line. And here's an example electric potential, probably around a single thin wire. That contains an infinite amount of information. How do we store this on a computer? And the answer is, we don't. We do something else. So what we're going to do is divide space into cells. And I'm showing something here that's 13 by 13 cells. Each one of these cells has a width. We call that delta x. So it's its size along the x-axis. It also has a height, and we call that delta y. Now, even within each one of these cells, we still notice that the function is varying smoothly. So even inside one of these cells, we still have an infinite number of information. So in fact, what we have to do is only store the value of that electric potential at one infinitely small point within each one of those cells. So what we're looking at here is actually what's stored in memory. And so what's happening in between these points, we don't know. Now, we can make some good guesses and interpolate and all that, but the point is we don't store or really know the information between the points. So in our minds, this is really what we want to picture when we are making functions discrete and what we're storing. Now, when we go ahead and plot these to the screen, we look at something like this, and it's easy to get the impression that really what we've done is stored a constant value for the function without the cell, and that's absolutely not true. We know the function value at an infinitely small point within the cell. Outside of that, it's varying linearly or something else from point to point. So we'll plot it. We look at things like this, but don't let your brain get programmed into thinking this is how the data is actually stored. The previous slide is how things are actually stored. And also, we don't really draw those lines. We just draw it something like this. And, and it will also, rather than label it with array indices on the X and Y, we still label it X and Y, so it looks like a nice picture of our electric potential. Now, notice one other thing. This looks rather pixelated. So right away, we can tell that the smaller we make this delta X and delta Y, the smaller we make those cells, the smoother this will look. And in fact, the more accurate our simulation will be. The price we will pay for that is it takes longer to simulate. And so there's always this trade-off of how do we get accurate enough answers, but the simulation still runs pretty quick. And in fact, I would say 99% of all the research done in computation is done to minimize the amount of information we have to store while maximizing accuracy. So here's a little bit more about that fundamental trade-off. And we're showing this function that we've been looking at, probably just some kind of Gaussian function. Here's that function represented with three by three pixels, nine pixels, 25 pixels, 100 pixels, now a 20 by 20 grid, 50 by 50, 100 by 100. And we can even see visually that there's sort of a, a trade-off here. Like well, there'll be very little difference between these two, yet probably a huge simulation difference. So as an engineer, we have to come in and pick, all right, this 10 by 10 grid, that's the sweet spot. That's where I'm gonna have the best compromise between accuracy 
and the simulation time being quick enough. And we'll talk much more about how to pin this down. Finite difference approximations. We need finite difference approximations because we have a differential equation to solve. That has derivatives in it, and we only have discrete functions. So somehow we have to learn how to calculate derivatives when we only know the function at discrete points. So what we're showing here is a function, and I'm only showing three discrete points here at x1, x2, and x3. And I'm showing a function value that we calculated at x1, we'll call that f1. A function value we calculated at x2, we call f2. And a function we calculated at x3 that we call f3. And this dotted blue line is not really there. This is just a reminder of what the function may actually look like. We don't know this. All we know is the function at these discrete points, but I am showing this for convenience. Let's say we would like to calculate the derivative at f2. Well, we know that the derivative is slope and we can draw a tangent to the blue line and we understand the true slope. However, remember, we don't really have access to this blue line. I'm just drawing this here for us to visualize what's going on. So we, in fact, we can't really know the true slope. We have to somehow estimate that just from the information at these three points. So how on earth do we do that? Well, slope is rise over run. And so what we're going to do is connect these two endpoints, F1 and F3 with a line. And whatever the slope of this line is, is what our approximation will be for the actual slope. And we can see here, that's actually pretty close. If we look really long enough, we might say, all right, it's not exact, but it's actually the best that we can do. All right, so slope is rise over run. So what is the rise? Well, it's F3 minus F1. So that's gonna go in the numerator with how we'll approximate this. And then what is the run? Well, from F1 to F3, that's a span of two delta Xs. So that's our run, two delta x. And in fact, here is our first finite difference approximation for calculating or estimating the slope at the midpoint at F2. Next thing we can do is suppose we wanted to know the slope at these midpoints. At F1.5, I'll call it, that's the midpoint between F1 and F2, and then F2.5. What if we wanted to know that? Well, the slope at an X value of 1.5, we could say is the slope of the line connecting F1 to F2. So that rise over run is F2 minus F1, and then the run would be delta X. And that's exactly what we have here, F2 minus F1 over delta X. Then our second point, same thing, we'll connect F2 and F3 with a straight line. And so then the rise is F2, or sorry, F3 minus F2, and the run is delta x, and that's what we have here, f3 minus f2 over delta x. Now, why are we doing that? Because ultimately, what I'd like to know is the second order derivative at f2. And so the second order derivative is the slope of the slope. So what I've done now is calculate the slope on either side of f2. And so if we calculate the slope of the slope at the midpoint between these two, we'll actually have the second order derivative at F2. So let's go ahead and do that. The second order derivative is the slope of slope. So that means if I look at the, the rise between the two slopes and divide by the run, I will actually get my estimate of a second order derivative. So now I'll just throw in these two expressions I've derived above and then turn my algebra crank. I'm gonna bring this delta X to the denominator so I get a delta X squared. And then I sort out all these different terms and I get F3 minus two times F2 plus F1 over delta X squared. And now we have a finite difference approximation that calculates a second order derivative at X2. Okay, now we're ready to look at our differential equation. What we have here is two second order partial derivatives. So what do we do? Well, let's look at one at a time. Now remember, we're storing this electric potential V on a two-dimensional grid. And so the array indices will be IJ. So for this first one, we're looking at a derivative in the X direction. So if J is the vertical position, we won't touch array index J. So J just stays J. 
but we will be touching the I index. And so that will be the electric potential at the next cell minus two times the electric potential at cell IJ, same cell, plus the electric potential at the previous cell. And that's exactly what we had on the previous slide. And of course, divided by delta X squared. So that is how we will estimate our second order derivative of the electric potential in the X direction. We have our y direction. Now we want to calculate our partial derivative in the vertical direction. So the i index is the horizontal direction. So here i just stays i. We don't touch that. We're only touching j. And we're taking the electric potential at the j plus one cell, the next cell, minus two times the electric potential at the j cell, plus the electric potential at the previous cell, or the j minus one cell. And of course, all that's divided by delta y squared. So it's really the same finite difference expression for x and y directions. It's just that we have, we have to do something slightly different with the array indices. And of course, one we divide by delta x squared and the other we divide by delta y squared. And these numbers, delta x and delta y, could be slightly different. We like them to be as similar as possible, but it's not necessary. Okay, now we can take these two finite difference approximations, add them together, and what we have is our homogeneous Laplace's equation now written in finite difference form. And so we're one step closer to being able to solve this with a discrete function. So there's our equation from the previous slide. The first thing we're gonna do is multiply all this out. So we see all the terms in the numerator separately. Then we'll recognize there's some common V terms here. For example, here's a, a VIJ and here's another VIJ. So we can collect all of these common terms and we end up here. Okay, now that we have this in finite difference form, we're ready to put this into matrix form and then solve that to calculate the electric potential. So this is where we were. That was the final form of our finite difference equation. And we want to put this into matrix form now. So let's take a grid that's just four by four points. Now this isn't realistic. A, a real grid on your computer is gonna be something like 100 by 200 points, somewhere around there. But that gets to be too much to draw here on the screen. So we have a four by four grid and we'll let the spacing between the points be 0 0.5. So we have a delta X and a delta Y being the same thing. So what I'm gonna do is write this equation once for every point on the grid. So I'll write it for this point, then 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 this point, and all the way through. So I have 16 equations. And I would recommend on your own time, plugging in these values for delta X and delta Y and seeing how we get these numbers four, four, minus 16, four, four, and do that by hand. Not for all 16, just pick a couple. So we have our finite difference equation written once for every point in our grid. We have a huge set of equations. So this is obviously something that we could put into matrix form, but we're not quite there yet. Notice what has happened. We have had to reach outside of the grid. Take this first equation. It is trying to access a value from right here, V01. Also, it's trying to access a value from up here. That's the V10. And that's because our finite difference equations, they're reaching above and below and left and right. And that's fine for the points on the interior of the grid, but all of these points on the exterior of the grid are reaching outside the grid and we don't have points outside of the grid. So everything I've highlighted in yellow over here on the right, those don't exist. What on earth do we do with those? Well, the easiest thing to do is just set them all to zero. And this is called Dirichlet boundary conditions. Now, this is good to do if the solution you're after actually is zero outside of your grid. And so this will have consequences of how we set up our grid, because if we have our grid too small, too up close to our transmission line, well, the electric potential is not zero there, but we're forcing it to zero, we're not gonna get an accurate answer. 
And this is going to force us to have to make sure the edges of the grid are far enough away from our transmission line that electric potential around the line actually does fade to zero physically. Okay, so we go back to our 16 equations and everywhere we had one of those terms that was from the outside, we're forcing it to zero. So we just drop it from our differential equation and we end up here. We drop it from our finite difference equation, sorry. So all those terms that didn't exist, we've just crossed off. Now those 16 terms, 16 equations, we can put into a big gigantic matrix equation. And what we're doing is we're listing in a single file line all of the electric potentials throughout our four by four grid, all 16 points. And here's where all the numbers from all of those 16 equations, they all collected here. And each one of those equations equaled right, equaled zero on the right hand side. So we might ask, is this solvable? Well, let's call this big thing here L. And the reason we're calling it L is because that's sort of the Laplace's equation or the Laplacian happening onto this electric potential. So it's essentially saying the Laplacian of our electric potential equals zero, but in matrix form. So we have an LV equals zero. Is that solvable? Well, let's pre-multiply both sides of this equation by L inverse. And that's really the same as taking this L matrix bringing it over to the right hand side to solve for that little v. Well, when we do that, this L inverse times zero just gives us a zero column vector. That's a trivial solution. And so that isn't an answer. Why, why are we here? Why don't we have an answer? It's because we have all zeros here. And that's because we have not told this formulation what voltages are conductors are set to. So that's our next thing. We have to somehow force those potentials to represent that correctly in this matrix equation. So here's our four by four points and here's where we are. So let's say we're doing a microstrip line on this super low resolution grid. So our little microstrip line is overlapping these two points here. And I might wanna set both of those to five volts. Notice how I've modified these two rows in the matrix equation. These two rows correspond to these two points. I've set all of the numbers in these rows to all zeros everywhere. So I've just thrown out all numbers that were there, but I went in to along the center diagonal and set those diagonal elements to one. So there's zeros everywhere, except I've placed ones in the diagonal position. Then over here in this final column vector, I placed in the numbers that I wanna force those two potentials to. So let's think, all of these rows were a finite difference equation, but what I've done is I've completely thrown out that information here. And let's think about what equation this is now. Well, it's just a one multiplying V22 equals five. So I've thrown out my finite difference equation and replaced it with this. And that's exactly what we wanna do. We are forcing the potential at those two points to be five. And our ground plane here, let's say I wanted to force all of these to a value of two. Again, I will replace all of these rows with all zeros, but I'm gonna go back in the diagonal position and insert ones here. And then over in this final column vector, I'm placing the numbers, that's the potential that we're forcing onto those points on the grid. So we've thrown out all these finite difference equations and we replace them essentially with these four simple equations where we're just forcing the potential at those last four points on our grid. Well, now when we do that, we no longer have all zeros here. We have actual numbers here. And so this matrix equation becomes solvable. We now have a B column vector, we'll call it. And so now when we bring our L matrix over the other side, this is something that we can solve and we've calculated our electric potential on that grid. Okay, so we have solved the electric potential. How do we calculate the transmission line parameters given that electric potential? The first thing, and all of this is really considered post-processing. Essentially, the problem is done. We're post-processing this electric potential to figure out all of the transmission line parameters. 
So the first thing is calculate the electric fields. Well, we know that the electric field intensity E is the negative gradient of this electric potential. This is the thing we just calculated. So we'll calculate the negative gradient and we have E. We have our constitutive relation. So if we take this electric field intensity we just calculated, multiply by this dielectric function point by point, we'll get our electric flux. And now we have D. On to our distributed capacitance. Well, the total energy stored in a capacitor, and this is how we're calculating and we're looking at our transmission line as a capacitor. The total energy stored, we have to integrate the energy density. And from electrostatics and electromagnetic field theory, we know that the energy density is one half D dot E. Well, we brought the one half to the outside and we've just calculated D and E. So we can take the dot product at every point on our grid and add it all up to get the overall energy U. We know from circuit theory that the total energy stored in a capacitor is the capacitance times the applied voltage squared divided by two. So if we solve this expression for C, so we're essentially swapping, we'll bring C over to the side, bring U over to that side, and then we replace U with our integral. Here's the expression we end up with, one over the applied voltage squared times this integral, where we're adding up D dot E across the entire grid. And in fact, that's actually one statement of code in MATLAB, but we're not getting too deep into the code in this particular lecture. But when we do that, we have our now our distributed capacitance. On to the distributed inductance. Well, one might think, don't we have to go back to those magnetostatic equations to get the distributed inductance? And yes, we could do that, but we have something simpler that won't force us to formulate a whole different model. If we look at a signal on a transmission line and a wave in a homogeneous medium, uh, it turns out that the, the wave along that line and the wave, if we were to take the dielectric in that line, make it an infinite medium and, the, and look at an actual electromagnetic wave, those two things travel at the same velocity. So the signal on the line would travel at the same velocity as a wave if it were completely embedded in the dielectric of the line. So that has to mean that the speeds are the same. So one over square to LC, this is the velocity of a signal on a transmission line, has to equal one over square root of mu times epsilon. This would be the speed of a wave in a infinite medium of this mu and epsilon. And okay, we can solve this for LC, we square both sides and we end up with this expression. And the C naught arises because remember this mu is the permeability, it's the free space permeability times the relative permeability. Our permittivity is the free space permittivity times the relative permittivity. The relative terms end up here and the free space terms end up being the speed of light squared. So we can solve this last expression for L, and what we see is if we have a way of determining the distributed capacitance, we can calculate the distributed inductance from it, and we do. We just developed a way to calculate distributed capacitance. So that all seems good, but we have one other problem to solve. The way we've been talking about this we said that the electric and magnetic fields are decoupled. So that means that the distributed inductance should not be affected by any of the permittivity in the line, but it seems like it is. And so in fact, if we change the permittivity, our distributed capacitance changes, doesn't it make sense that the distributed inductance changes? And that does make sense, and that is true. And so really what we have to do is calculate a different distributed capacitance. And what we have to do is just throw out all materials on our grid and replace it with something that's completely homogeneous everywhere. I normally just choose this to be air, but we really, we can choose anything. And so we, we call these materials mu r epsilon r. So that is not necessarily the epsilon r of the line. It's just one that we conveniently choose. And I normally just choose ones for these parameters, make it all air. And so from that, I'll calculate a distributed capacitance. And I call that the homogeneous distributed capacitance. And that differentiates it from the actual real distributed capacitance when I have the real materials on the grid. And from that, I calculate the actual real distributed inductance.
given the real distributed inductance and the real distributed capacitance, square root of L over C gives me the characteristic impedance of that line. And that's a really important parameter for design. The other thing we often need for design is the phase constant. This is really telling us how quickly the, or how quickly phase is accumulated along the line. That's omega times the square root of LC. And so given the frequency we're interested, we just calculated L and C, we can get the phase constant. From this, we can also calculate an effective refractive index. So if we have some weird dielectric distribution around our line, some air, some something else, uh, overall, the, the signal on the line is traveling at a certain speed. And so it's like it has an effective refractive index that's controlling that speed. So with the characteristic impedance and the phase constant, we can use those to go ahead and design all kinds of transmission line circuits. I'll mention and end this with, this was a simple electrostatic approximation. So as we formulate it, it is not able to calculate or compensate for any kind of loss. So our R and G parameters drop out of this. We're only calculating L and C.